Hey everybody, welcome to quarantine lesson number six. Number six is going to be a review of lesson four and five because I haven't read all of your quizzes that you've turned in yet, but based on the questions you guys asked me and some of the stuff you turned in, you obviously didn't watch the lesson and you just went straight to the quiz. And so because you went straight to the quiz, you had no idea what was going on. And some of you even asked me questions like, well, the quizzes are the exact same, I don't understand. They're not the exact same because one should have been about the ocean and the other one should have been about the land. I went through the lessons and gave you resources that you could have used to finish your project and I don't think you did. So I'm gonna spend a little extra time going a little extra into marine and terrestrial ecosystems in a way that I wouldn't if we were in class because I don't think you paid attention uh, and I don't think you learned what you should have learned from the last couple of lessons and the quizzes that I gave you. Fair warning, the quiz I'm going to give you this time is going to be a little more difficult and very specific to this video. So if you try to skip the video and go straight to the quiz, you will not get it correct. If you're following along in your notebook, you're on page 69. Now I'm going to go through way more material than you can fit on the notes section of your notebook. And since we're not coming back to school, you know, screw the left side pages. So if you wanted to put like marine on the right side and terrestrial on the left side, you can. Or if you just want to condense it all down into one note section, you can do that also. But there's going to be way more. Don't try to like copy everything. Just copy the most important parts as you go along. Your title is a review of marine and terrestrial ecosystems and your essential question, what are unique characteristics of marine and terrestrial ecosystems? So I'm going to start with marine ecosystems. So some fun facts about the ocean, 70% of the earth's surface is ocean, which means only 30% is covered by land. The salt content of the ocean is 3.5%. What that means is if you had a liter bottle, 35 grams of that would be salt. Due to that salt content, it is more dense than regular water. That salt content also causes the ocean to freeze at a couple degrees lower than regular water. The ocean has a lot of zones, and those zones are classified by how close they are to the land and how much sunlight they receive. So if you look at this little picture, you can see that not only is the ocean separated by like layers down and you can see like the the blue getting a little darker as it goes down but it's also how close it is to the uh, brown which would be the land under the ocean so the seafloor so there's a bunch of different cross sections and zones in the ocean so the neuritic zone i'm going to go back to my picture so you can see it it's up there in the left corner it is on the continental shelf. And if you remember like watching Finding Nemo, right? And they talk about like going out there to touch the butt, which was the boat off the coral reef. There was a big drop off and then it kind of got like dark out there. That's what they mean by the continental shelf. So there is a the layer around all the continents that is shallow. Sunlight goes down to the bottom of that. So there is a lot of nutrients, a lot of sunlight, a lot of biodiversity. There's photosynthesis happening there, and there's a lot of different symbiotic relationships like coral reefs. Coral reefs are a symbiotic relationship between coral and zooxanthellae. When the waves go through it, the water current goes through it, it filters out little organic material in the ocean, and so it eats that. That's what it gets for its food. You also have algae such as kelp and seagrass. There's plenty of mammals. Those are your sea lions, your dolphins, all those sorts of things. Your sea otters will live out here. Um, you have a thousand kinds of fish. Crustaceans, those would be all your shelled things like crabs and lobsters and shrimp. You have mollusks. Mollusks are your clams and mussels. And then you have your regular old algae. Then you have your benthic zones. So the word benthic means the land along the bottom. And benthic doesn't just mean towards oceans, it could also be called benthic like the land under a lake. Um, there's no sunlight happening when we get to the seafloor past that continental shelf. So most of the animals there are called detritivores, which means they live off of any organic stuff that's gonna like float down to the bottom. 
So they are quite literally bottom feeders and scavengers. So if some fish somewhere gets eaten by a shark, whatever little bits of fish don't get eaten by the shark, like gradually float down through the ocean. And if it makes it all the way to the bottom of the ocean, then those invertebrates that live down there, sea stars, sea urchins, there's a bunch of different types of flatworms and roundworms. Uh, bivalves would be bi meaning two. Um, so those would be your clams and mollusks and stuff like that. There's crabs, plankton, and bacteria that live along the seafloor. And so they will concentrate around something dead that's fallen. Like if a whale dies and it goes all the way and it actually makes it all the way to the bottom of the seafloor, you're going to see a thousand sea stars just like on it in no time and they're breaking it down. Here's a picture of some of those things. Those are all different types of organisms that have been pulled out of the benthic zones in the ocean. All right, and so then we have the open ocean part and what you think of the open ocean. So it's away from the land, it's out in the water. The official word for that is pelagic and that would mean open ocean. So we have different layers and those layers of open ocean really depend on how much light is getting down. The epipelagic layer is from the surface down to about 200 meters. Light can penetrate through that whole space. So that's where you have photosynthesis happening. You have algae, you have diatoms, you have phytoplankton. It actually contributes to the majority of all photosynthesis on Earth. So most of the oxygen you breathe was created by the algae diatoms and phytoplankton in the epipelagic zone of the ocean. It is more than the Amazon rainforest. It is more than all the trees put together. You have your zooplankton, your tiny little things that are eating those phytoplankton, and then you have all your fish. You also have all your sea mammals, like your whales and dolphins. They have to be up towards the top because they have to breathe. So they're closer to the surface, and that's where you're going to find most of them. Your middle layer is your mesopelagic, and you can probably figure out that meso means middle. But your mesopelagic layer is about 200 meters to 1,000 meters. There's very little light. There's not enough light for real photosynthesis right now. Uh, this is where you find all the ones that have bioluminescence, uh, the little things that, that like glow like fireflies. Uh, swordfish, you'll find a bunch of little squid and cuttlefish. Everybody's favorite is the blobfish. You'll find him in this region. A bunch of jellyfish. And as we go down through the ocean, we have less oxygen, which makes sense because as we go down, we have less light. You'll find fewer organisms that can deal with the fact that there's less oxygen as we go down. Now, a lot of those little bioluminescent things will drift up into the epipelagic layer to eat during the nighttime. As we go down, you'll get your bathypelagic to about 4,000 meters and your bisopelagic, which is down below that. It is really hard to find a list of animals down in those spaces because the only way we can see them is by sending a little submarine by down there and that one little submarine in 70 percent of the earth's surface it doesn't see a whole lot the things that we know are down there we're getting into the dark there's no light giant squid are down there we know for sure uh, that's your angler fish which has the little light on it and then you have a bunch of of little things that are blind and when i say blind i don't mean just they, they can't see like they never even develop eyes like evolutionary wise eyes are not needed so they just don't even have eyes they don't have any colors why because it doesn't matter because nothing can see so you have a whole bunch of little eyeless colorless things down there mostly they are invertebrates and you'll have some of them concentrating around thermal vents and you'll have chemosynthesis and you'll have some other ways of creating energy. I do have some pictures of the different layers as well as I can get some of those layers. Your epipelagic layer is the layer that you're thinking about. It has all the different types of fish. We can actually see all the different types of fish and mammals and sharks because we have enough light to take a picture. As we go further down, we don't have enough light to take a picture. Uh, we just happen to get things that float by the submarine, and so we might get a picture of it. There's no way of people going down there because of the immense pressure. This is actually a grouping of both mes mesopelagic and bathopelagic organisms. All right, so we're done with the ocean. Let's move on to the land. Your terrestrial ecosystems would mean all of your land. In seventh grade, you should have covered all the biomes. Your biomes are classified by how much precipitation they get and their temperatures. 
And due to the amount of precipitation and temperatures, your biomes will have very specific plants that match them. Here's a little map of the world so that you can kind of see where they are. Notice that there is a definite correlation between the latitude and the biome. So if you look at that little light blue up at the very top, that's your tundra. It is above 60 degrees latitude. Your taiga is your next one. The light cream color is grasslands. The orange color is also grassland. They kind of split grassland into temperate and tropical. But one thing I want you to notice about those grasslands is they're usually in the middle of continents. Your rainforest is along the equator, so you can see by that light green color where the equator would be. And then your desert is the bright yellow. You will notice there's a couple layers of desert also. They're about at 30 degrees latitude, so it goes across Mexico and then Northern Africa. And then there's another one that goes across the middle of South America, right there on the edge the bottom of Africa, and then it matches the Great Desert in the middle of Australia. All right, so we're gonna go from the least amount of precipitation to the most amount of precipitation when we talk about our biomes. Generally speaking, deserts have less than 10 inches of precipitation a year. They can be hot deserts, those are the ones that you usually think of, like the Sahara, but there's also cold deserts, and those are your tundra areas. They get less than 10 inches of snow a year as well. Usually it's snow because they're further up north. All the plants and animals that you can find in the desert are adapted to have little or no precipitation. So things like cactus will actually time when they, you know, because all plants for photosynthesis need sunlight, carbon dioxide, and water. So in order to get carbon dioxide, they have little pores, stomata that open to allow air into the leaf. But cactus, first of all, don't even have leaves. Their leaves have turned into spines. But the stem of the cactus, the little stomata stay closed during the day and they only open at night. And so by opening at night, the air is cooler. They're not gonna lose any water. It's called transpiration. You will also have, especially up in the tundra, short grasses and lichens. Here is a picture of the Sonoran Desert in the American Southwest. There are large parts of the desert that have zero vegetation at all, and that's just because there's not enough precipitation to support that many plants. This is a picture of the tundra. I know it totally doesn't look like a desert because, I mean, look, there's like rivers and streams and stuff. But the tundra is a little bit special in that the ground is frozen. It's called permafrost. So anytime it does snow, it does not sink into the ground the way it does with us. Whenever it rains for us, it'll actually go down into the ground. Permafrost, the ground being frozen, it doesn't. So all that water just kind of sits so there's a thousand little puddles everywhere. There are millions and millions of mosquitoes in the tundra. Next, we have grasslands. Grasslands can be split into two sections, your temperate and your tropical. Your temperate grasslands are the ones in the United States. And then the savanna is usually your tropical ones. And that one you can find in Africa. And really the only difference between those two is how close they are to the equator. Your savanna is closer to the equator, so therefore it gets more water. It can support some more plant life. Savannas will also have trees. Grasslands experience very seasonal weather, and by seasonal, I mean Mean, there's a wet season and a dry season. So there's a time of the year where it rains and then you have a time of year of drought. Grasslands are characterized by very long grasses. By long grasses, I mean over two feet tall. They can get up to four feet tall. There's a thousand little different types of flowers, you know, blue bonnets, all that kind of stuff. Here's a picture of the United States grassland. You can tell there's absolutely zero trees, a whole bunch of flowers, and nothing but grass out there. Here, in contrast, is the savanna in Africa. And then notice you can see like trees out there. So that's the difference between the two. Yes, you still have the long grasses, but with the extra tropical part of savanna, they'll get enough rainfall to support some larger plant life. So now we're into our forest. We have three major types of forest. Your taiga by far is the driest it can get less than 50 inches of usually snow because it's up there in the northern part next to the tundra. They are also called coniferous forests. Those will be your pine trees, your spruce trees, all the trees that have needles and cones, and they stay green all the time. They don't lose their leaves. You also have temperate deciduous forests. Again, temperate, and temperate is referring to between 30 and 60 degrees latitude. And these are all of your trees that drop their leaves. They have the four seasons, and you can literally see the four seasons of summer, spring, winter, and fall. So that's the, the eastern part of the United States. 
And also there's a large deciduous forest in Europe. Then you have your rainforests. There's two different types of rainforest. The United States actually has a temperate rainforest. It is along the coast of California, Oregon, and Washington. It doesn't get quite as much rain as the tropical rainforest, but it still gets enough rain to have gigantic trees. Your tropical rainforest, most of you know about that. You can get anywhere from 200 to 400 inches of rain in a year, and it has a large amount of biodiversity. Here are some of your pictures. Here's your taiga. Notice all the little pine trees. That water, by the way, has a weird color to it. Notice it has that cloudy kind of blue color to it. And that is because there is a lot of silt. Silt would be very, very fine dirt formed from glaciers. Here's a picture of your deciduous forest. And so all the ones you can think of where, you know, they lose their leaves. That's what you got. Here is the temperate rainforest. These are the giant sequoia trees along the coast of California. Really, they're just gigantic looking pine trees. The picture on the left shows one of them in wintertime, and you can barely see a little bitty person down there at the bottom that shows you the scale of that. It's really hard to get pictures of these trees because they're so gigantic. And then here's an overhead picture of your rainforest. It's hard to get a picture of a rainforest also because if you're in the rainforest, it's just dark. It's just carpeted in trees. There's no way for you to like get any sunlight. And so a lot of competition happens amongst trees in order to get high enough to get the most photosynthesis. All right, so I hope you paid attention. I'm going to give you a five question quiz about your marine ecosystems and your terrestrial ecosystems. So check for it on Google Classroom. It will be very specific questions based on this lesson. You will not be able to skip straight to the quiz. I hope you're doing well. Stay safe. We'll see you next time.